la Asamblea Legislativa Plurinacional decreta Ley de Derechos de la Madre Tierra, capítulo 1, Objeto y Principios, 3, Garantía de Regeneración de la Madre Tierra, el Estado en sus diferentes niveles y la sociedad en armonía con el interés común, deben garantizar las condiciones necesarias para que los diversos sistemas de vida de la Madre Tierra puedan observar daños, adaptarse a las perturbaciones y regenerarse sin alterar significativamente sus características de estructura y funcionalidad, reconociendo que los sistemas de vida tienen límites en su capacidad de regenerarse y que la humanidad tiene límites en su capacidad de revertir sus asciendes. 3. Guarantee of the regeneration of Mother Earth. The state, at its various levels, and society, in harmony with the common interests, must ensure the necessary conditions in order that the diverse living systems of Mother Earth may absorb damage, adapt to shocks, and regenerate without significantly altering their structural and functional characteristics, recognizing that living systems are limited in their ability to regenerate and that humans are limited in their ability to undo their actions. Capítulo séptimo, Derechos de la Naturaleza. La naturaleza, o Pachamama, donde se reproduce y realiza la vida, tiene derecho a que se respecte integralmente su existencia y el mantenimiento y regeneración de sus ciclos vitales, estructura, funciones y procesos evolutivos. Chapter 7. Rights of Nature. Article 71 of the Constitution of the Republic of Ecuador. Nature, or Pachamama, where life is reproduced and occurs, has the right to integral respect for its existence and for the maintenance and regeneration of its life cycles, structure, functions, and evolutionary processes.
rights of nature. Rivers might one day argue for their course to be changed, because that change is necessary for the long-term survival, say, as an adaptation to induce to human-induced climate change. The Wanganui River in Aotearoa, New Zealand, has been recognized as a legal person by the New Zealand government following long-standing negotiations. According to the scholars Irene O'Donnell and Julia Talbot-Jones, granting legal rights to New Zealand's his Wanganui River catchment, Te Awa Tupua, has taken eight years of careful negotiations. The new legislation introduced at the national level transfer ownership of the riverbed from the Crown to Te Awa Tupua and assigns a guardian the responsibility of representing Te Awa Tupua's interests. The guardian will consist of two people, one appointed by the Wanganui Iwi, a local Maori people, and the other by the New Zealand government. Substantial funds have been set aside to maintain the health of the Wanganui River and to establish the legal framework that will be administered by the Guardian with support from independent advisory groups. I have a question for you. What does it take to enforce the legal personhood of a river or other natural entity? First, there needs to be a person appointed to act on its behalf. Second, for a right to be enforceable, both the guardians and users of the resource, quote unquote, must recognize their joint rights, duties, and responsibilities. To possess a right implies that someone else has a duty to observe this right. Third, if a case requires adjudication by the courts, then it takes time, money, and expertise to run a successful legal case. Enforcing legal rights for nature, therefore, requires not only legal standing, but also adequate funding and access to legal expertise. How will they decide which rights to enforce and when? Who can hold them to account for these decisions? And who has oversight? Even in the case of the Wanganui River, there remain bitten questions about water rights and enforcement. And this example shows that conferring legal rights to nature is just the beginning of a longer legal process rather than the end. Although the legal rights can be created overnight, it takes time, money, and money to set up the legal and organizational frameworks that will ensure these rights are worth more than the papers they are printed on. And I would like to highlight the limitations of the law and argue for a shift in vision about how we perceive the world and its natural elements as resources, quote unquote, and commodities, quote unquote, far from a horizontal relation where all living organisms are equal.
March 6, 1912. Mr. Frank Kleinschmidt, 4122 3rd Avenue, Seattle, Washington. My dear sir, you will receive from the treasurer of the Carnegie Institute a check for $1,132.50, which is a payment for the following and at the following rates. One large polar bear, $200. Two half-grown polar bears, $100 apiece, $200. Freight from Nome to Seattle, $60. One male doll ship, $100. Two female doll ships, $80 apiece, $160. 110 bird skins for $3.75 apiece. In your letter of November the 17th, you told me that the freight from Siberia to Tacoma on the bears was $60. You will observe, I refund this to you, the freight from the coast to Pittsburgh in cold storage on the three bears amounted to $90, which we paid at the end of the line. I submitted to Mr. Todd, our curator of birds, the specimens and asked him for an opinion upon them. He told me they had nothing new to our collections and the specimens were not first class. That is to say, they were poorly made skins. After a careful examination, he reported to me that they were worth about $3. But I did better than that, as you will see, and marked them down at $3.75. On inquiry, I found that those ship have been acquired by several firms of taxidermists recently, never at more than $75 a piece. You will observe that I have done better in this case that would have been done by dealers. The polar bears are not satisfactory as they would have been had the two smaller specimens been cubs. As it is, they are full half-grown and are not as nearly interesting as it would have been to have had younger animals. They came through all right, were skinned, and there has been a good deal published about them in the newspaper and journals to whom I gave an account of their shipment. In this case, I've done the very best I can. Polar bear skins can be found, as I have informed Dr. Young in Norway and Sweden, at prices ranging from 35 up to $75. When I was in Christiana last summer, a year ago, I saw a stack of about a thousand from which I could have made my pick, and I was tempted to do so. They were flat skins intended for rug purposes, but the biggest and finest of them was only quoted at about $75 of our money. In allowing you $400 and paying the freight, the bears stand us something over $500, which does not include the cost of skinning, preserving, and tanning. I think it is a very liberal price. I do not want any more polar bears. We have two very large specimens in our zoo here, much bigger than the one you sent us, which will naturally die one of these days, and the skins of which will come to us. The bears that do want, the bears that I do want are Kodiak bears. I want to get the biggest going. I have endeavored, my dear Mr. Kleinschmidt, to be as liberal as I can to afford to be, knowing that you have taken the trip at considerable expense. I was not at all enthusiastic about it at the outset and am not now particularly gratified by the results. It would have been much better if the birds had been put up in a different way. The skins are distorted and they were packed very carelessly. So they were not, so they were tossed about eater and teeter in the boxes in which they came. They are not strictly first class specimens. With kind regards, begging to be remembered to Dr. Young when you see him or write to him, I'm yours. Very truly, Director, Carnegie Museum.
in the cinema, a news and property gazette from Wednesday, March the 5th, 1913, Captain Frank Kleinschmidt got a review for his expedition commissioned by the Carnegie Museum. It reads as follows. Cinematographing wild animals in their natural haunts, an interesting series of pictures secured 18 degrees from the North Pole. Quite a unique series of animal pictures by Captain Frank Kleinschmidt, photographer, big game hunter, and naturalist, secured 18 degrees from the North Pole, were shown at the New Gallery Kinema in London before a crowded audience, which included the premier and Mrs. Ashkiss on Monday afternoon, and elicited loud applause. A few particulars as to how these pictures were obtained may not be out of place. The Carnegie Museum of Pittsburgh, under the directorship of W. H. Orland, wishing to obtain scientific specimens of the Arctic region, Alaska and Siberia, commissioned Captain Frank Kleinschmidt to outfit an expedition and secure specimens of the fauna of these regions. Especially was it desirable to collect series of the birds and a group of the big gang animals of these unexplored regions. The expedition was a gigantic success and new and unknown features are added to the result of the enterprise. One of these new departures in science was to collect data of the animal life with the cinematograph or moving picture machine. Hunting with a rifle is comparatively child's play to hunting with a camera or moving picture machine. One may shoot successfully at a distance of 300 yards from cover that conceals the hunter. A photographer or wild game must operate from within 50 to 100 feet. The motion, while operating the crank, will scare away any wild animal and often days were spent in fruitless hunts with the cinematograph. The polar bear and brown or cinnamon bear also are no gentle playmates and after the photograph had been taken at close range, the captain had to hastily transfer his activities from camera shooting to rifle practice. As a result of this, Brun has a place of honor in the Carnegie Museum, stuffed but not with the photographer à la naturelle. The expedition left Seattle on June the 14th, going to Alaska via the Inside Passage, and was fortunate to penetrate as far into the Arctic as Angel Island, situated in 72 degrees north, only 18 degrees from the North Pole, and very seldom ever reached by any explorer. What a performance. 20,000 feet of film were taken on this trip, and of these, 6,000 feet were made up into six reels for the study of wild animal life, adventure and amusement for the public. These will, we have no doubt, prove a very great attraction wherever shown and will fill the new gallery cinema in London for a long time to come. They are as beautiful as they are remarkable. Thanks to Rodney Carter, in an article written in 2006, titled, Of Things Said and Unsaid, Power, Archival Silences, and Power in Silence, is mentioning one of the key features of the archive, and I quote, text in the broadest sense of the term, including written, visual, audiovisual, and electronic, are the currency of archives. Archival texts, however, are not fully representative of society. It is impossible for archives to reflect all aspects and elements of society. The notion that archives are neutral places with no vested interest has been undermined by current philosophical and theoretical handlings 
of the concept of the archive. It is now undeniable that archives are spaces of power. Archival power is, in part, the power to allow voices to be heard. It consists of enlightening certain narratives and of including certain types of records created by certain groups. The power of the archive is witnessed in the act of inclusion, but this is only one of its components. The power to exclude is a fundamental aspect of the archive. Inevitably, there are distortions, omissions, erasures, and silences in the archives. Not every story is told. <laughs>